Come on and lift him up right there. Come on and open your mouth right there. Come on and clap your hands right there. And glorify the name of Jesus. No other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, one day every knee shall bow, every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. At the name of Jesus, demons tremble, angels prostrate fall, burdens are lifted, doors are open bondages broken and set free at the name of Jesus no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Jesus no other name like yours Jesus run every demon out of the building Jesus heal those who need healing Jesus lift up every brow bow down head Jesus let the oppressed go free Jesus lift every depression Jesus touch our nation no other name like the name of Jesus Thank you for another week. Thank you. I woke up this morning with a mind stayed on you. I was in my right mind. Had reasonable portion of health and strength, activity of some of my limbs. I was, I was able to get up. I had food to eat. I had clothes to wear. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm not going to take that for granted. Thank you. Oh, glory for another week. And you are worthy of praise. Now, speak to our hearts. We might be able to have a fresh revelation of your word. We're going to process it in our lives, live it out. And process it in our minds and live it out in our lives. What a gracious God you are. Ask you to bless us now and enough you later on give us traveling mercy home and whatever is accomplished during this day we'll say yes to your will in the mighty marvelous matchless ineffable name of Jesus go ahead somebody and say praise God and amen well I've been teaching this holistic Christianity for years the integration of principles values and truths of Christianity into every part of one's life as opposed to treating one's life atomistically that is as if it is divided into atoms or separate often discrete and disconnected elements we've been talking about spiritual emotional intellectual physical social impacts in our lives and specifically being a Christian ought to order one's praying feeling thinking eating exercising sleeping interacting with people uh, I'm waiting on an amen every aspect of our lives yet recently because of a revival and a revolution in the area I've become aware of the fact that there needs to be a lot more attention on the area of a work there is a disconnection between Sunday worship and Monday work many Americans worship on Sunday but seem to be clueless as how that worship should connect and impact their work on Monday. Some speak in tongues on Sunday and cuss people out on Monday. Some are falling out on Sunday and falling upon others on Monday some come to church on Sunday and then drive like maniacs on Monday 
And as I began to study, I began to see that we need to connect Sunday worship to Monday work, to integrate faith work and economics, which are connected in the Bible, but seldom connected in our theology and in our teaching. And so one of the first things that arrested my attention was the fact that the average person spends 40 to 60% of his or her time at work and of only about 5% in corporate worship. So we come and we praise and we worship, we teach, we encourage, we fellowship. It's not an end in itself. That shouldn't be where it stops. Corporate worship should prepare us to advance the reign of God and offer a taste of his kingdom in various spheres of influence. And if our lives revolve around the corporate worship experience and we skip 40 to 60% of our lives, how do we integrate our Christianity? I mean, if we come to church and we shout and we jump and we fall out and we do that here, and don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I want to see all of that. I, I love it when people are shouting. I like to see people shout. You see me standing here sometime, and I won't stop you. I'll just go on. I'm just smiling. I like to see the Holy Ghost get on people. I like to see them get free and shout and, and praise. I just like to see it when they drive. I just want to see some of that Holy Ghost over there, you know, just not all here in the sanctuary, in the worship center. And so in the first message, we talked about and explored the fact that the Bible and work is a characteristic of God, a central element of being made in his image and his likeness. We've, uh, over my lifetime at least, and most of my, what I've heard in church, he is the uh, intellectual image, the emotional image, the spiritual image. We are the spiritual image of God, but nothing about vocational. In the second message, we cover the cultural mandate of, ex of Genesis 128. God mandated us to flourish and govern the earth, to create something out of what he gave us in the Garden of Eden. And then in the third message, we covered the impact of the curse that was levied against work because of the fall of Adam and Eve. And we learned that work is cursed. I don't think people have quite figured it out yet that even though we're saved, still work is cursed. And you go to work and there's a whole lot of hell going on over there. And you come to church, there's a little bit going on over here too. That something's wrong, Larry Crabb said, with everything. As long as we are here on this earth, there's something wrong in everything we do, everything you touch. But there's coming a day when nothing will be wrong with anything. That's called heaven. But right now, work is cursed. But Jesus has redeemed both us and our work. So I'd like to start off today by first affirming and talking about how God and Jesus has redeemed us and then moved down into our work. Would that be all right with you? Thank you for the six people who are here. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 10. I'm going to read long passages of scripture today because I want to set the context and help you get your Bible reading done. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and the labor of love and the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brother, beloved by God, his choice of you. We're not going to preach about that, but I'm just glad I'm chosen. And... For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Word of God. Go ahead and be seated. I'm just going to go off here a minute. I will return. Y'all can join me if you, if you want to. If not, if the rain has you held down, it's okay. He is touting the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives. I'm preparing for the next Ashland Theological Seminary class. The next semester we'll be dealing with issues in Christian um, theology. And one of them, we're going to be talking about the Holy Ghost. 
And when you read the New Testament, the Holy Spirit and his power and the Holy Ghost is everywhere. We need Holy Ghost power in our lives. Pentecost penetrates the New Testament. And you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We need power in our lives, power to walk right and talk right and to act right and to do the things that God wants us to do and what we're talking about here to work right. I'm just in the text if you don't know where I am. He says that they became imitators of him and the Lord. Who are you imitating? Well, how many of you are watching a lot of TV? Oh, don't put your hands up. Forget it. Um, if you're doing that, you're imitating probably TV personalities, but we ought to be imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. He walks before us, and we ought to be walking in his footsteps. Now, a lot of people don't want to walk and imitate him because he got crucified. But the afterwards is resurrection. So there is a positive outcome when you go through what you need to go through. They had become examples to all believers. We need to be examples to folks around us. I'm working with some situations around me where believers are acting like sinners. Where is the love of God? Where is the love that ought to be spread forth? But we ought to be examples to people and to all believers. I'm just going through the text telling you what happens when you got saved. I'm trying to get you to think back and to see what God has done for you. I'm trying to get you to go back a little bit and recognize where he brought you from. I'm trying to get you to go back and recognize how far he's brought you from. Because if you went back 10 years or you went back 20 years or you went back 30 years, you could think about where you were then and where you are now, where he brought you from he brought me from a mighty long way then he said the gospel is trumpeted forth from them everybody get your got your trumpets out let me hear this uh, uh, just just uh, well y'all all right some down here trumpeting and others won't even lift their hands so I'm not sure I'm not sure what's going on, but you ought to trumpet the gospel. Every place you go, you're trumpeting the gospel. At work, at play, at school, everywhere, you are proclaiming that folks might know that Jesus is the Christ. He came down through 40 and two generations. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He walked the streets of Galilee, and then he died on a rugged cross, buried in a borrowed tomb, laid there three days, but early one Sunday morning, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand, was seen in post-resurrection appearances for 40 days, ascended into the heavens, seated on the right hand of the Father, waiting until his enemy should be made his footstool. I'm trying to tell the story so somebody understands who he is. Trumpet the gospel as much as we may not recognize it. People still need Jesus. They still need the Lord. And then it says they turn from idols to serve a living and true God. Go on back in your life. No, back a little further. No, 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 back a little further. When you were serving idols, when all that was concerned and the only thing you cared about was your car. Oh, that was yesterday, wasn't it? When all you cared about was your house, when all that you cared about was stuff that you thought you were serving, but were not serving the true and living God. And if you look at where God has brought you from, Ah, I, I'm looking at some of y'all, and y'all looking at me, and you're giving me a faint shout like you've been a saint all your life. I know where you came from. You should be shouting, tearing the rug up right now, because I remember when you came in the door smelling like alcohol. I remember when you came in the door, toe up from the flow up. I remember when you didn't know who you were, and you had no idea about your self-esteem, but God stepped in your life and saved you, and now you a deacon, and now you a minister, and now you're a child of God. But I remember where you came from. But you were saved, but you were set free. And then it says they are waiting on God's son to come from heaven. We're not preaching the eschatology of, of, of the Bible anymore. We're not waiting on God's son to come from heaven. Uh, we are waiting for our income tax check. But we ain't waiting for God. We ought to be waiting for him to come again. And Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus. In short, what I tried to do was help you see the power of God's redemption in our lives. 
And when you move from there and you keep on reading, he moves from the redemption of our lives to the redemption of work. Don't stand up. I'll read it. First Thessalonians 4 and 9. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. That might hold, stop the presses. He just said there, I don't even need to talk to you about loving nobody because you already know what to do. For indeed, you do practice it toward all brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more, to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to attend to your own business and to work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Lord, add a blessing to the reading of your word. Oh, there's so much here we could talk about, but we simply want to point out an essential aspect of presenting our Christian faith to the world is seen through the diligence that we exhibit at, our, at work. We are to, do, let's start back at the text though, we are to lead a quiet life. I said a quiet life. I'm just probing. I'm just probing, trying to find some amens. Just honey, a quiet life. That's what you want to live, right? A quiet life. You don't want to be running around all over Goonie land like a chicken with his head cut off. You just want to be, go home and sit down and just be quiet. Be able to go to work and go home and just sit down and chill. A quiet life. You didn't know this stuff was in the Bible, did you? And you can lead a quiet life by staying out of other people's business. We would not have the issues we have in the church if you would just stay out of other people's business. If you stop talking about what you don't know to be true and asking questions and insinuating and passing along gossip, we would not have this problem. Lead a quiet life. Shut your mouth. And then stay, I'm just, I'm in the text now. I'm not going to make this up. Then stay out of other folks' business. I remember when I was a child, my mother had a couple of 78s around. I know I've dated myself. You don't even know what a 78 is. Tell your neighbor what a 78 is. It's a record. They used to have 33 and a third RPMs. Then they had them little records about this big. They called them 38s. Now, I know some of y'all was reaching in your pocket. I have to get your gun out, but I wasn't talking about a gun. I'm talking about a record. And at 38, one of them was Sam Cook. I was born by a river in a little tent. And ever since that, by that river, I've been running ever since. Oh, yeah, I remember I was a child. But when I was a child, there was musical ability in me then. They were trying to send me places because as a four- and five-year-old, I was singing all the stuff that they were doing as a three- or four- or five-year-old. And I remember that I believe, I, you're going to have to take this one by faith, but I believe there was one there by the Consolers. And they were singing a song that I'd like to introduce you to. You got six months to mind your own business. And I got six months to leave yours alone. Let me, let me, let me rehearse that for you, because some of you are not going to get it. You got six months to mind your own business. Six months to leave yours alone. Then they would go through the months. Well, you got January, well. February, well. March, April, May. And they would go through all the months and then come back. You got six months to mind your own business. I got six months to leave yours alone. If we would mind our own business. I ain't getting a lot of shouting and amens on that. The church would be in a lot better place. In addition, he said, then you ought to work with your hands to be occupied with your work. Now, they work with their hands because there wasn't no office jobs back there. They work with their hands. 
That means that when they got, they were occupied with their work. When they got done, they were tired. And when you're tired, you can lead a quiet life. And you ain't got no energy to be in nobody else's business. The reason you got so much energy to be in other people's business because you ain't tired. If you was working hard, you'd be tired. Jesus talks about the power of example in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see you on the usher board. That's not what it said. What does it say? See your good works, and your good works will glorify your Father who's in heaven. In the kingdom and in the culture, our good works glorify the Father that is in heaven. A part of our ability is availability, and faithfully engaging the world is our calling, not withdrawing from it. Jesus engaged the world as a nonviolent resistor of the culture to establish the kingdom of God. Don't go back and fall out and do nothing. We want you to engage the culture, but you do it through a quiet life and faithfulness and good work and minding your own business. They said if you did these things, then you wouldn't have a lot of trouble with the folks on, on the outside. So some of them were in need. He said you wouldn't be in any need. They were in need because of improper attention to work. And some of us are in need because of improper attention to work. You ain't got nothing because you won't go to work. Now, it goes beyond that. After you go to work, then you need to not spend everything and save some. You need to go through all of that. But first, first, you get to go to work. So just turn to your neighbor and say, go to work. What did they say? Did they cuss you out? <laughs> go to work. But sitting at home, taking off every little hangnail or whatever, go to work. Now, I used to have to, uh, over the course of time, I've had a number of these various lessons that need to be taught from a biblical perspective, and one of them was, big, it was go to sleep, go to bed. Because a lot of y'all don't ever go to bed. You stay up all night, you leave the TV on all night, you're doing those things all night, and then you are tired. Then when you are tired, you can't go to work. But if you go to bed at night, you'll be ready to go to work in the morning and put in a full day's work. Nobody want to do that because that's not what we're taught anymore. We're even, even Christians are now trying to figure out, how do I get out of work? I'm going in, but I don't want to work too hard. I don't want to overwork. I don't, want, I don't think that's going to be your problem. Most of y'all that I'm looking at right now, well, let me turn around because I know how that gets. Overwork ain't your problem. Underwork is your problem. Now, we got some folks that we're going to talk about who are workaholics, who are, who are sucked up into their work and are idolizing their work. But we got a whole lot of folks that just don't, can't give a good day's work. They're playing games at, at work and taking time off and leaving early. And I'm going to look up. But the problem is, we do that because we don't know work is eternally valuable. Not only is work important here, but Jesus teaches that work will be important even in heaven. That's seen in the parable of the talents. And I would just jump in there, but today I'm feeling real, real biblically. He said, that ain't no word. I know I made it up. So I'm going to read some more scripture, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Matthew 25, 14, don't stand up, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. The one he gave five talents to another two, to another one, each according to his own ability, he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gave five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more talents. And the master said unto him, Well done. Good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Enter into the joy of your master. 
Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I've gained two more talents. And Master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I know you to be a hard man. Reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered his head to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather what I scattered no seed. Then you ought to put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to, to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Here we got three workers. I'm going to have to change them up a little bit to try to help you understand today. These are three investment portfolio managers who have been charged by their master to grow his wealth and expand his net worth. Two of the ma managers invest their, ma their ma master's wealth in the market, and one of the ma managers stuffed his master's wealth in the mattress. I'm not going to teach about this right now, but I want to hit it because over the course of time, it'll come more and more. One withdrew from the market, one, the other two interacted in the market. We are withdrawing from the world rather than interacting with the world. The owner's response tells us a lot about the workers. Two managers who demonstrate diligence receive commendation and are promised greater responsibility and opportunity in their future work. When you do what God calls you to do, guess what your reward is? More work. Y'all figured that out. Some of y'all, haven't you? That's why you ain't doing nothing. I don't want no more. When you do what he called you to do, he rewards you with more work, more responsibility. And you heard the commendation preached many times. And if you've been in church your life, any, any part of your life, somewhere the pastor is going to say, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful. And we apply that just to life, but we don't apply it to the context. The context is work. Well done, good and faithful slave. You're faithful a few things. I'm about to put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of of your master. But look at the response of the master to the lazy worker. There are two words there that ought to give you a tip off. Wicked and lazy. They re he received a rebuke. The furthermore, the investment portfolio was taken away from him and given to another and he received a hellish destiny. Outer darkness. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here Jesus makes the connection using this parable. Christian faithfulness now and the moment in redemptive history when the faithfulness comes, it will be rewarded not only now, but in history and in redemptive history. Consequently, work is connected to our reward in heaven. Rather than we think it's all going to get burned up, our work, it's not going to be burned up, but it's going to be rewarded. So I said, what? Go to work. The problem is when I said that, you thought about church work, not about the work that he sent you to. Working hard at things which God has assigned to us will not only glorify God down here, but it will carry over to the new heavens and the new earth. Our work has immeasurable value, eternal significance. Because people are going to want to know, when you work like that, what's wrong with you? When everybody's playing computer games and you're working, they're going to want to know what? What's wrong with you? When you leave on time and everybody is already gone, when you're, they're drinking whatever and you're drinking ginger ale, after a while somebody's going to ask you what? What's wrong with you? And that's a door open to do what? Witness. 
to tell them who you are, what God has done for you, and why you do what you do, because I'm trying to be who God called me to be. Now watch this. If you don't do that, sooner or later, they're going to call you on your Christianity. Where to work? Where do y'all got a job? Where y'all at? Sooner or later, they're going to say to you, I thought you were a Christian. Now, wait a, wait a minute now. You don't care nothing about nothing I do, as long as it's okay. But at one little point, when you think I'm off somewhere, then you're going to impact, I thought you were a Christian, and it impacts your testimony. So, in order to have a testimony, i got to be able to do what God has called me to do with faithfulness. Now, that's an ugly word, ain't it? Be faithful. Go to work. Yeah, go on and go every day. Stay to the end of the day. I got to go to last week because some of y'all looking at me real crazy. God didn't create you for a day off. He didn't create you for the weekend. He didn't create you for a vacation. He didn't create you to retire. He created you to work. And uh, we'll talk next week about the rhythm, the warp and woof of working and resting. We need to get that straightened out. But first of all, some of y'all need to go to work before you can rest. All you do is leisure. All you do is point towards the leisure. That's, your, that's where you're going. That's where I got to get to. So you, I, got a, I got a day off coming. I got a day off. Have you worked any this week? Faithfulness means that you are there. And you know we have a faithful God. I'm not getting no amens right there. We have a faithful God. If God treated us like we treat him, what would it look like? If he just said one Tuesday, I don't feel like giving you no breath today. I'm taking off. You'd be in bad shape. But God is faithful. And we walking in his footstep are to be faithful. So my stability, which flows from my Christianity, leaves a testimony so that people can see what's going on. Now, I want to do four things. I want to talk about four realities of how we treat the world and how we treat work and reality. And then I'm done. I'm going on. I got to get home, eat, and be ready for the playoffs. I ain't got time to stay with y'all all day. I will have done my work. I'm going to work hard. So, therefore, I need to be able to take off. I need some downtime. Now, some of y'all like, well, you, you didn't work. You just got up and preached a sermon. You don't know how much preparation I did for this sermon. You, you don't know all that I had to go through to preach this sermon. You don't know how many people I had to deal with to preach this sermon. You don't know how much hell I had to go through to get this lesson. So you may not know that. But you have to take it by faith that when you had, I, you know, I did have a job. You know, this ain't no job to y'all. But when I did have a job, that people began to see me different. Why? Because of the, the way I acted. They wanted to ask the question. They wanted to find out what's going on with me. A witness to Jesus. Now, I wouldn't have you raise your hands, but I know that this is not truth or consequences Sunday. So some of y'all wouldn't raise it anyway. So, but let's just do it anyway. Some of us think we are on the Titanic. This is called lifeboat theology. Oh, we get some rain to go along with that too. We are simply rearranging the deck chairs while we wait for the ship to sink. Some folks think they're on the Titanic. What kind of work ethic do you have when you're on the Titanic? I asked a question. Would you answer? You're just shuffling chairs around, messing with paper at work, doing whatever you're doing, because this is a sinking ship. I don't need to accomplish anything. I don't need to do anything, because it's going to go under after a while. I should just ask, how many Titanic people do I have in the room? But 
you wouldn't raise your hand. So some of us think we're on the Titanic. Some of us think we're on the love boat. The love boat. It will be making another run. The love boat. We got no love boat people here? Isaac? Where the love boat folks at? There they are. They're, wrong. They're, they're, they're here. The love boat theology is we believe we're on a vacation cruise. And the object is to get as much pleasure as we can out of the journey. So a lot of us are just sitting around trying to get pleasure. Going to this, going to that, doing this, doing that, buying this, buying that. Because I'm trying to get some pleasure out of this. Ain't that what it's all about? At the end of the game, he with the most toys win. Some of us think we are still on Noah's Ark. God's got a covenant with us, and he's intent on redeeming the animals that are on the ark. It ain't really about us. We just got to try to help the ark and get these animals to where they need to be. I don't really have, that's my purpose. At least I got some purpose, but it ain't about me. But some of us need to understand that we're on an aircraft carrier. From the deck of God's church, he is deploying us in the enemy territory of the world to advance his reign. I said we are on an aircraft carrier, and God has deployed you in the enemy territory at whatever job he has called you on so that you might bring and advance his reign where you are. I'm not getting an amen in the church. And the reason I'm not getting an amen because we think the only place he's deployed us is in the church. No, he deployed you on your job. Whatever job you got, he probably sent you there. He deployed you there so you can do what needs to be done where you are. Now think about the impact we're going to have when Christians who are deployed from the aircraft carrier of God's church are all over this community doing what God called them to do. You work at McDonald's, but you're deployed there. You're not just a hamburger maker. You are God's hamburger maker. Make them hamburgers like God called you to make them. You need to understand that a Big Mac is a testimony to your God. I'm not getting no amens up in the house right now. Each one that you make, you are making under the auspices and power of the Holy Ghost, praying over it, using those opportunities in order to impact somebody. Oh, I'm just preaching myself. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let it, we give, let us have it, your, have, it, have it your way. So I don't know. I don't think them people work at that Burger King over there. They must not work over there. It must not because when they, oh, you tell them to hold the pickles and the lettuce, they get upset. Go through there. We don't, we don't do that. That's not what we do. You know, this is what we got. Don't argue with the customer. God called you to be a whopper maker. Make them whoppers under the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm not hearing no amen. Oh, because I ain't talking about you. That's why. I'm not a, I don't, I'm not a whopper maker. I'm not, well, then go over there to the office where they called you where God has called you and work even though your boss is Satan himself. You would say, well, I'm not going to work for him. I'm not going to do that for him. Well, when Paul wrote Romans and said we ought to give uh, uh, allegiance and work for those folks, he was talking about the Roman government. That's pretty evil. Your boss might be the devil himself. You're not serving him. We learned last week that you're serving God. You're doing what he called you to do. So go over there and go to work and do what he called you to do. Wait a minute, did I get you yet? 
God called you over there to come into the rubber company and to work. God called you to go over into the beauty shop and work. God called you to go over to the grocery store and work. God called some of you into government uh, jobs so that you might work. God called you and placed you there. You say, no, he didn't call me. I just went over there because I'm not talking about what you think. I'm talking about what he's doing in order to use you. And he's going to open up some situation. There are going to be some actual circumstances where you need to speak into, you need to step into, you need to live into in order to change what's going on. I feel like preaching up in here, but I got to go. I'm reading a book right now, just got through finished this morning, called The Scandalous God. And it talks about the scandal of the cross. The cross is God speaking in the human situation. And whenever you speak in the human situation and you tell the truth, you subject yourself to crucifixion. Whenever you tell the truth, people are wanting to try to take you out. But God has called you to step in. And the cross is not a doctrine. The cross is not a theory. The cross is a lifestyle. The cross is something that you live. It is not something that you simply preach and teach. It's the way of life. You got to learn how to live and walk through your pain and your suffering and your struggle and your trial. I don't want to go down in it, but I'm feeling it right now. Because I just got through reading it. I can preach it later on. But the cross is a paradox. You can't understand it because it is not a doctrine. It is not a theory. It is a reality that is a paradox of multiple things happening at the same time that don't make no sense. Tell me how God giving God's self can save me. Tell me how God could, on the cross, there could be the absence of God in the profound presence of God. Ah, die, ah. I don't think you understood what I even said, did you? On the cross is the profound presence of the Son of God himself, and yet absent at the same time is God the Father and Jesus asking him, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The presence of God and the absence of God at the same place. The love of God and yet the repentance and the guilt of God at the same place. The paradoxical oxymoronic, something that cannot be explained at a reality when God steps into this particular place. I got to go, but I'm feeling something right here. And so work, like the cross, is a liminality. It operates in liminality. You say, what's liminality? Liminality is when you're in neither place. You're not over here and you're not over there. When you get married and you're standing up on the stage, before they announce and say you are married, you are neither single nor married. Touch somebody said, I, I don't know if I got that or not. You're not single because you're about to get married. You're not married because you haven't made it yet. You're in limbo. You're in a liminal, liminal space. The cross is a liminal space. It's a space between heaven and earth. It's a space between earth and man. It's a space between doing something and doing nothing. It's a space between reality and irreality. It's a space between punishment and grace. It's a space between... You can, I could go on forever on that because it's a, it's a paradox. And God is doing something there that cannot be explained and cannot be propositionalized and cannot be uh, put in any word because it is beyond anything we can understand God himself stepping forth from eternity to stand in time and place well you can look at work like that if you want to because when you go to work you ain't at home and you ain't at church I wish I had an amen right there you're not at home you can't go over there and put your feet up on the desk and take your shoes off well you can but I wouldn't suggest it and particularly wash your feet and your socks if you're gonna do that but you won't go over there and take your shoes off and put your feet up and and do all of that you're not at home you don't go over there and start having prayer service at your desk you're not at church you got to tell church folks they don't know they get this kind of preaching I'm going I'm gonna go over there and I'm going wait a minute this is not church 
You are in a liminal space where you need to be able to show the, 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 the oxymoronic, uh, paradoxical, uh, confusing, uh, same things happen at the same, two things happen at the same time, but where you are at your work desk, uh, you want to let them know, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I'm not carnal, uh, but I'm not totally uh, in heaven yet either. So don't misunderstand me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take something, but some things I'm not going to take. Let me make sure you understand me. I'm going to talk to you about Jesus, but if you get too close on me, I might have to push you back. Now, you need to understand. Y'all don't, don't even know what I'm talking about. Because, what, what was I talking about anyway? What am I preaching about? Work. I mean, what am I preaching about work? Let me go back and mark it so I can know what I'm supposed to be talking about. Oh, I know now. We're talking about how your work gets redeemed so that it, you ain't just working and it comes to the end of the day and you walk away and ain't got nothing and don't know what it was all about. When your work is redeemed, guess what? You can get up in the morning running to work. I can't wait to get there to see what God's going to do today. How many feel that way? Yeah. Stop it. Most of the people got a job they don't want to work, some play they don't want to be, working for somebody they don't want to work for, trying to figure out if God and praying that God would get them out. But that's not the old church. We ain't singing with the old church song. Lord, don't move that mountain, but give me strength to climb it. No, we saying, Lord, move the mountain, the, the, the continent, the world. Move all of it. Kill them all at work. I don't want to be bothered with these people. I don't know. You got to learn how to work your way through and suffer. Not hearing nobody. For the name of Christ, I suffer. For the good of the people, I suffer. For the well-being of the kingdom, I suffer. I go through it. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sadomasochistic. I'm not looking to suffer. It's coming. I don't have to want it. I don't have to ask for it. It's coming. But I want to be able to yield to what's going on. I want to be able to stretch out my hands and say, not what Jesus says, not as I will, but as thy will. When they start talking about me, when they start persecuting me, when people are misunderstanding me, when they're talking about me all over the company, now he thinks it's something. You know, the next question going to ask, so you think you better than us? You can't go out with us tonight? No, I don't want to go out to you tonight. It ain't a matter that I can. I, can, I can't. I can if I want to. I used to get in that with them all the time at work. They'd be like, so, so you, don't, you can't drink a drink with us? I don't want to. I'm not bound. I'm free. If God want, if I want to take a drink, I can take a drink. But I don't want to. My Christianity is too much important to be that. And besides, I don't know if I want to be with you. No way. I'm going with the saints. Y'all forgive me. I'm just trying to help some folks who are messed up in here who don't understand that you're not under any, 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 any doctrine of the law. You're not bound by anything. You have the freedom to be able to make a choice. But the choice we make is for God Almighty. The choice we make is to walk with Jesus. The choice we make. And when I make that choice, I know full well that I'm setting myself up for pain. That the devil's coming after me. That folks are not going to understand. They're going to be messed up. But there's coming a day. Oh, God, hallelujah. There's coming a day. I just felt that. There's coming a day when they, after they get through talking about me, after they get through messing with me, after they get through all that stuff, they're going to come to me one day and say, can you pray? <laughs> Hallelujah. Can you pray for me? Uh, my, my mother has got cancer and, and, and can you pray for me? Uh, they're talking about firing me. Uh, can you pray for me? Uh, 
uh, my, my son is having trouble in school. Uh, uh, can you pray uh, for us? Uh, I just want somebody who can get a prayer through. Can you pray? Now, you were nothing a minute ago, but can you pray for me? Because prayer changes things, and they know how to get a prayer warrior when they need somebody to get set free. When you live your life like God called you to live it, then people are going to come and say, can you pray for me? And then that's when you get to go ahead and show them what is made out of them. You get to lay your hands on their head, and I'll probably just go on off. In the name of Jesus, who come on us, come out, you foul. They were, I'm going to try to cast the devil up out of you because I want you to be saved. And you're going to be saved when you're following my life. Connecting Sunday worship to Monday work. Now is the day of salvation. Come to Jesus now. We got to connect Sunday worship to Monday work. I want you to think about this for a moment. When we deploy people from the aircraft carrier of the church in this community all over the place, it's going to have an impact upon the community. The sea level is going to be changed. It's going to rise because there are so many Christians who are doing what God called them to do. If you need to be saved today so he can help you with your work and everything you do, all you need to do is pray and say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life, save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and for giving me the gift of eternal life. If you pray that in Minta, I'm so excited for you. These are altar workers standing here. They would love to pray with you just to, to make sure that you know what it means to place your trust in Jesus. You need a church home, we give you that opportunity. But I believe there's some folks in here that ought to be saying, Lord, help me with my work life. Help me with my attitude. Help me with power. so that I might be able to have an impact for your kingdom. Deploy me in enemy territory. Make sure all my guns are working. All my love is on display. Everything that you've equipped me with is working because I want to have an impact for your kingdom. I'm going to sing a little bit and then I'm going to pray for some folks who are looking for a change. And then we're going to get the praise team up and then we're going to get out of here and go home. 